rumor has it, Aaron Taylor Johnson has been offered the role of James Bond. There's a massive controversy with Late Night at the Devil and its use of AI. And we got new trailers for The Penguin, The Acolyte, and Furiosa. Let's get into this week's movie news. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. There are a ton of stories to get into. New castings, new releases, a bunch of re-releases, a bunch of trailers... But first... Well, that's a lot of stuff, man. So there's so much stuff. I don't know if we have time to cover it this day. It really is we'll a big, try. big week of movie. We'll try, but let's movie get into news. the box office, which is doing really well right now. Three releases are killing it right now. So the first new release this weekend was Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which debuted with a healthy $42 million, better than the previous film, Ghostbusters Afterlife. And audiences are kind of divided on this. I'm looking at... Some people are liking it. Some people are hating it. It doesn't kinda... seem that divided. It's like a 40% Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, yeah, it's not I that think divided. that people yeah. aren't really enjoying this I was being film. nice. Yeah. I was being too nice. I really liked Afterlife too, and I haven't seen this one yet, obviously. We didn't get an invite or anything, and I, they had a premiere last year. They didn't week. invite us! What the hell goes on? Come on, guys! So, I'm curious. Obviously, I'll check it out because I love the, the cast is insane. You got the OGs plus all the new members of the Ghostbusters team. But it doesn't seem like audiences are digging it. And I saw a lot of reviews. It just says, oh, it's kind of bland. There's not much there. Not much substance. I'm not sure I want to see it. Spectacle the reactions are A lot of reactions with people we know are just like very just like, uh, it's pretty bad. Yeah. So like the dialogue and the script. Yeah. Seems kind of, that's what people are saying. It's sort of generic script. Also, I heard that, you know how it's like the New York City's freezing. Yeah. Apparently, it happens at the very end of the movie in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would be, I thought it was a great idea, and the whole movie would be frozen in New York City. That would be cool. That's what I thought the movie was going to be. Nope, it's not. That's the whole trailer. Yeah. The whole trailer is, is New York's getting... So, apparently, just happens just for a few minutes. Oh, that's kind of a lead-on. Yeah, right? Oh, kind of man. Lame. Uh, something that's not lame and not a lead-on is Dune Part 2, which is back in the top two spots of the box office with $39 million. It's never it finally... left the top two spots. It's still in the second spot of the box office <laughs> <laughs> this week. It beat Kung Fu Panda uh, with $39 million in its third weekend. Absolutely chugging along. And then, He's Lisa al Gaib. Lisa al Gaib. Lisa al Gaib. Lisa al Gaib. <laughs> and then Kung Fu Panda came in third place with $38 million. Three very healthy releases. Both So healthy. They've been eating their greens, man. Oh, they got the super juices, man. They are going well. They've been shredding that, sh that celery, man. Treading celery. Shredding that celery. Shredding celery. Juicing it. What is going and on with They're the juicing the celery, then they're baking the, the leftover fibers, the and they're making that are celery crisps. The things that are, you're saying right now make no sense. People do that. No, they don't. Dude, part two does that. <laughs> <laughs> also closing in on 500 million for Dune Part 2. Kung Fu Panda no, is No, broke it. Oh, broke it. Sorry. Yeah, broke 500 million. Kung Fu Panda is doing very well internationally as well as is expected. Uh, another recent release was Immaculate, which came in fourth place with 5 million dollars in its domestic weekend. Arthur the King came in fifth place with 4 million dollars on its second weekend. Late Night with the Devil next with 3 million dollars on a pretty wide release at 1000 theaters. And then Love Lies Bleeding came out on its wide release with $2.3 million. And Problemista, A24's other film, is opening wider with $220,000 this weekend. On a theater of over 200 theaters? Uh, so Problemista is at 240 theaters, and then Love Lies Bleeding is at 1,400 theaters. Copy, copy, copy. And then copy Late that. Night's probably the same around 1,400 theaters Late as Night well. with the Devil's at 1,000 theaters yeah. right now. I would say predictions, Problemista will top out with 2 million total, and then Love yeah. Lies Bleeding might hit 5 or 6 million total. Woo! That's not good for independent film. Same thing with this big controversy with Late yeah. Night with the Devil, which we'll get into in a minute, but the first biggest piece of news, which is something that we predicted a year ago, this was pretty easy for us uh, because if we were running MGM and we were selecting, the, we'd the already next, be filming right now. If we were selecting the next James Bond, it was a no-brainer for us that Aaron Taylor Johnson's the guy. And rumor has it, it's obviously not confirmed. He probably signed a contract eight months ago, but you know, <laughs> you know how it works in Hollywood. Rumor is that Aaron Taylor Johnson has been offered the role of James Bond from MGM to star in the next franchise of films. When they reboot it, I would expect a confirmation in the next couple of weeks. But it's, it's yeah. probably a done deal. That's how it always works. They always just slowly roll this stuff out. Yeah, and I think uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson's a terrific choice. As we mentioned, and we did a whole episode on it, and we talked about a bunch of great actors who could be really good in the role, and Aaron Taylor Johnson seemed to fit the bill really well, so we always liked him as the choice. Also, rumors are out that Matthew Vaughn is wanted as the director. 
And they previously worked together, obviously, with Kick-Ass and Kick-Ass 2. I'm not sure, especially with Argyle, I'm not sure Matthew Vaughn might be the right choice. Yeah, I don't know if his style completely fits Bond because of how serious Bond is. Because Bonds are dramatic action films. Not that Matthew Vaughn can't do that sure. and hasn't done it, but yeah. his, his movies are very stylized. So maybe he tones down on the style. And Argyle was not received very well. But at the end of the day, it's Aaron Taylor Johnson. He's perfect for the role. Yeah. He can do everything. He's got the look. He's got the suave. He's insanely athletic. He's great at stunts. So I think he's obviously the perfect age as well for what they want, like a younger Bond. Also, uh, literally the day after he won his Oscar, they won their Oscars. Chris Nolan and Emma Thomas actually were photographed meeting with Barbara Broccoli literally the next day. Whoa. Now, keep in mind, Chris Nolan and Aaron Taylor Johnson have worked together. Aaron Taylor Johnson was in Tenet. So, just throwing that out there. Nolan and Thomas went to see Broccoli literally the day after the Academy Awards. That's interesting. They were photographed, like, outside walking, probably towards her offices. I saw some photos of, of Emma and Chris at, in Venice, mm -hmm. uh, Italy, recently, probably on a little vacation. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It just went all over the internet. And they're, <laughs> they're holding maps, trying to, like, map out their route of where they're going to walk next. I love that they're using maps. I would love to do that. It, Venice is really great. And even with the smartphone, it's, it's tough to get around that city if you've never been before. Honestly, the map, a map... Physical map is probably the best for Venice because we struggled with our Wi-Fi and yeah, our servers for a it's while. Okay, service, yeah. And so maps are probably best. To, it's just better too, yeah. just like so you're not looking at your phone because it's such a beautiful city. But yeah. I, I've used the map to get around Venice too, and it's it's not easy. It's I love it's, how it low looks the same. I love how low key they seem. Like they're not hiring like a, a team of people to just like escort them everywhere. Like they're just like a normal couple. Just like tourists with maps out, like where is this? <laughs> I love They're just it. regular people, They're just man. regular dudes. <laughs> you know who's not a regular dude? Who? The Penguin, and we got a Penguin trailer which dropped for Max, starring Colin Farrell. This is our first final teaser trailer of the series that's coming up in late 2024. Very excited for this, Colin Farrell. This is a role that he wished he got more t screen time for in the Batman. He said because he got what he asked for because it's such a juicy performance. He's terrific. He's unrecognizable. The voice and everything is terrific. Y'all love him as as Oz in this in this film in this franchise. The trailer looks really really good. It's it said from Matthew Vaughn. He probably maybe produced and directed. Reeves. What did I say? Matthew Vaughn. Yeah. Matt Reeves. I'm guessing maybe he directed the first episode. or he, exec, he exec produced exec it. Exec produced it. Yeah. But they have the aesthetic. A lot of the same locations. A lot of the same interiors. Uh, that elevator with the neon symbols behind that, you know, Bruce comes up to get into Falcone's apartment. Yeah, I apartment. can't wait to see Harvey Dent in there. And then they're going to get everybody in there <laughs> eventually. So it's cool. They've kept the exact aesthetic and tone of the Batman, which we knew they would do. But now Oz is our main character as he's going to basically take over the city. It's going to be really interesting. I think it looks awesome. It has like American gangster vibes because he talks about an old gangster that he grew up respecting and admiring. And then that gangster who like gave back to the community. And when he died, he was he goes on this really cool monologue about that gangster. That criminal got a big parade from the city from the respect got a parade. They got a parade. And so I feel like it had some some of that American gangster DNA, the Denzel film. With his his um the gangster he worked for for years and admired and kind of uh, borrowed in in past in, in the the style of being a criminal was passed down to him and so I think that had that cool twist that cool tone to it and Sopranos vibes for sure yeah yeah doing his Tony Soprano very gangster vibes yeah it looks pretty cool I'm very excited about it and obviously everyone loves this world and now that the Batman's been delayed to an extra year to 2026 it's gonna be great to go back and revisit that world with some new content from there now let's get into the biggest controversy of the week with Late Night with the Devil a new film starring uh, David Desmalchian and the film you actually saw it, so you can yeah I saw it last synopsis. night so Late Night with the Devil stars David Desmalchian as a once super popular talk show host who is desperate to maintain his ratings with uh, Sweeps Weeks coming up. So he's come up with Sweep a... Sweep Sweeps Weeks? Sweeps Week. Sweeps Week. Uh, so he's come up with this crazy idea to have uh, a bunch of... I wouldn't say an exorcist on his show, but like a woman who claims that her... The girl that she is... Uh, the guardian of is possessed by a demon. Uh, and, and actual like exorcisms take place on the talk show and things go horribly wrong, but it gets the highest ratings for him. Uh, it's a it's a really interesting horror film, but obviously the controversy is uh, they filmmakers did use AI for three still images, uh, which were 
uh, created with AI and then re-edited with their graphics team to modify it a little bit. Um, and these are basically title cards that the talk show uses for in between commercial breaks, transitioning back into the show because the film is a combination of uh, using the talk show footage as well as behind the scenes footage and blending those together. It's a really interesting uh, approach. And so when the talk show comes back on the air, they'll they put up like a title card of "We're welcome back" or like "Happy Halloween, spooky season." And there are three of those images used in the film, but also the film has uh, a pretty huge montage, about five minute photo montage. Um, those AI wasn't used for that montage, but it was used for those three title cards. Um, I will say, I mean, it was it, it's a mistake to use AI. AI shouldn't be used um, in film, and I think that it's important to obviously shout that as loud as we can and and prevent things like this from happening in the future. But the, on the other hand, um, it's it's a very complex situation. I'm I'm not a fan of tearing down filmmakers, especially independent filmmakers. So if you don't want to see a film, don't see the film. And it's just like a judgment call. I will say that I saw the film last night and it was really fantastic and excellent horror film. So if you're a fan of horror movies, you'll love this. It's a really interesting, brilliant concept. And uh, so it was very shocking. I w- it's, it was just a, a horror movie I've never seen before. So I think they did a, a really wonderful job. And I do think that the filmmakers made a, made a mistake using AI. David Desmalchian had a great interview. Uh, you can watch online where he talked about it for a few minutes and um, he, he's disappointed in the response, but also adm- admits that, that this conversation should be happening. Um, and we'll see going forward in the future. Um, but I, I really enjoyed the film otherwise. Yeah, I'm not one to boycott a movie unless it's something more egregious than this. Obviously, people maybe don't realize that they had a graphics design team. Yeah, People were paid. They re-edited the photos. I, maybe they were going for it create an eerie image like to see what AI can come up with. I doubt it was like, oh, we don't have enough time. Let's lazily do this. Yeah. Maybe it was out of curiosity what AI would come up well, with. I was, and this, yeah. again, this was made... Before the strikes happen, you know, yeah. movies take years to get made and probably in post for like a year, year and a half. So this all happened before the AI strikes and everyone was having fun with AI yeah, for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and we were talking yeah. about this earlier, like AI wasn't invented yesterday. It wasn't invented during the strike. Yeah. I would be sh- shocked. I mean, I, I think most people would be shocked to find out how many movies they love have been using AI. Yeah. You know, and AI it, software and tools have been used in filmmaking like like for a very long yeah. time, whether it be sound mixing, post-production, pre-viz, set building like there's ai tools um have been around for a long time and you can even say that uh cgi uh, building cgi environments like things jurassic park in a way uh it was technically using ai tools of that day so it's been around for a very long time um when i looked more into it and i found out that nobody lost a job because of it like there was still a photoshop team that photoshopped all the other images and they did touch this up so jobs weren't eliminated by this AI use, it's not like they didn't. It's not like the filmmakers were like, "Fuck it, we're not gonna hire any graphic design team. We're gonna do it all with AI." That's not what happened. So, like I said earlier, there's a big montage of photos for about five minutes, and the graphics team did all that, and they did touch up the AI stuff. So nobody was prevented from getting paid, and every artist that worked on the film was paid. But that being said, I think this is an example of audiences, which is a good thing that audiences don't want AI in, in the creative art of media, uh, of filmmaking. Um, and so I think that it's a good thing that it's being um, talked about. But, I mean, if you want to not watch the film, don't watch the film. A lot of humans yeah. still worked on it. Yeah. And I get it. It's a slippery slope. If three images come in, then the next movie there's 20 images, yeah. 100 images, and what, a whole movie's going to make in it with AI. AI is here to stay. There's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. It's going to be used in Hollywood. It's going to be used in movies you love. It's already been used in movies you love. You just maybe It's like that V for Vendetta quote where... You know, if your government was responsible for the death of 500,000 people and the biggest tragedy in your country's history, yeah. would you want to know or yeah. you just want – or do you not want to know? I think that's where it is. Most people don't want to know even though it's happening. It's been yeah. happening for years. It's just – um, it is, it's a really complex situation and it's a, a shitty situation because the independent filmmaking scene is very – like as we just said, how low the, budget, the box offices were for these independent films from A24 this week. You know, it's a very – tricky uh, industry for independent filmmakers so i still want to support indie filmmakers and the the entire crew did an amazing job the set design the special effects the visual effects were really fantastic and uh, the entire group of artists who worked on the film deserve recognition so i just want to for me i'm like the 200 people worked on the film they did a fabulous job so i still wanted to show out and, and see the film 
And I, I thought it was really an excellent horror film. It's my favorite of the year for sure. Whoa, favorite of the year. But it yeah. is only March. Yeah. Well, my favorite of the last two years. Oh, the favorite of the last two yeah. years. Yeah. I guess last year was a pretty decent year for horror compared to 2022, which was excellent yeah. year for horror. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Let's move into some new stuff. So we got another trailer. This time for the latest project from Lucasfilm and Disney in Star Wars. We got our first trailer for The Acolyte, which was announced, I think, four years ago. Yeah. And went into production or pre-production. So Before we made the podcast. <laughs> this is a show that's been in the works for a while now. We finally got a trailer pretty quick compared to how – pretty soon to how soon it releases. You know, it's only coming out in less than two months, I think. Oh, really? And so wow. it came out to obviously – <laughs> a massive divided fan base, like usual Star Wars like fans. Star Wars. Over 160,000 dislikes compared to 130,000 likes on YouTube. So, like Star Wars fan base, mostly they love or hate whatever they get put out. <laughs> it looks pretty good. The action looks solid. Lots of uh, awesome combats. And it seems like it's trying to grab the darker tone that Andor grabbed with sort of sure. the visuals of Obi-Wan. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. so maybe if they get that dark tone in Andor, because they all I, I know Lucasfilm and Disney, they know that people loved Andor, even though it didn't get a lot of views. They loved people loved that show if they watched it, and that's what it feels like they're going with the the look of Obi Wan with the tone of Andor. Yeah, and if they're approaching a story about the Sith, I'd like them to go very dark. We'll see. I'd say go go super dark. And so this movie, I mean, this series takes place 100 years before episode one, The Phantom Menace. Okay, gotcha. And I'm not exactly sure exactly the full plot, but I know that there's been some crimes being committed. The Jedi in the world are at peace, but there is a myster- mysterious, mysterious things happening and crimes being investigated by specific Jedi, I believe. I think Dark, Darth Plagueis is going to be in this. That'd be cool. Yeah, I think that they might. It's Plagueis origins, That'd be maybe. Cool. I just hope they don't take the Sith character and then turn them into a good person. And heroic. Just kind of like how yeah. Obi-Wan did. It was very predictable. But if they keep doing that with their shows, I think they're going to have a villain problem. That's Same. what I'm saying. They should just go dark. Just go evil. Yeah. Same thing that like we've been talking about that with yeah. Sony and their villain problem. They keep turning their villains into heroes by the end of the show, by the end of the movie. Uh, I, I would say, yeah, just go dark, go it, evil. I think if you have a Sith, if you have Sith lords or, or Sith members, they really should be horrible villains because that's when it really works. Mm-hmm. The, the light and the dark, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, also, I wasn't expecting Carrie and Moss. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't even know she was in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks pretty good. I don't know if I'll watch it because I haven't seen the last two Obi Wan. I mean, Star Wars shows. I didn't watch Andor. I watched like half of Obi Wan. And I don't think I've watched the last season of Mandalorian after one episode. I kind of just turned out, tuned out. Yeah. Um, Boba Fett I didn't watch. So I'm sure a lot of people are very excited about this, though, obviously. No, yeah. Yeah. I know we know plenty of Star Wars fans that are excited. I just, I'm not not a big Disney Plus TV fan. I want to go to the movies and see a Star Wars movie, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm excited about. I'm excited about Furiosa. Heck yeah. Which just dropped a new trailer, images, and some posters this film will officially premiere at the Cannes Film Festival in May, very soon, so we'll be able to hear some early reactions in the, in just a few weeks. Uh, the new trailer is fantastic. I think it's much better than the the first trailer. We yeah. got more of um, Furiosa's backstory, more Anya Taylor-Johnson, and then obviously more Chris Hemsworth. And Joy. Anya Taylor-Joy, <laughs> and obviously more Chris Hemsworth, and they both seem fantastic and perfectly suited to the roles. And um, we got a lot, a lot more footage, and it just looks like a mad, crazy, stunt-filled extravaganza, and I'm really excited for this. Really creative filmmaking, too. I love the red apple with the black and white imagery as she picks yeah. it, and everything comes to color. Obviously, a Garden of Eden metaphor, probably. So The green I'm, place. I'm yeah. really excited to see what Miller has in store for us for this Furiosa origin story, origin. which is going to be awesome. I'll go back to Star Wars real quick. It was announced that all nine films of the Star Wars Skywalker saga will be re-released in theaters as a marathon on May 4th, 2024. One day. I believe this is going to be at Alamo Draft House. It's going to stink in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a stinky there. The longest I've ever done, we did three movies in a row when Dark Knight Rises came out in theaters and Midnight Releases used to be a thing and they were sick. We saw Batman Begins Dark Knight, then at Midnight Dark Knight Rises premiered. So was that was pretty fun, but it did get very stinky. Got pretty stinky. Just a bunch of smelly dudes. It was, it was like a locker room. They're gonna have, there's going to be like no time in between films. They're showing nine films in one day. 
and they're all two hours, two and a half hours long. These these happen though. Marathons yeah. like this, you can find in LA. They'll do movie marathons. They're like uh-huh. twenty four hour movie marathons or like twelve hour movie marathons. So yeah. they happen. You can come and go yeah. usually. So that's probably what the rules will be. You can come and go. Save go your take seat. a nap. Yeah. Go get some lunch. Go take a shit. Go for somewhere. a walk. Yeah. <laughs> go take a shit. <laughs> and usually when do we do not shit in the theater. <laughs> when we did the when we did the uh, the Batman trilogy. Marathon. It was what, like a half hour intermission between each. Yeah, there was like some that? time in between. Yeah, so you yeah. walked around. You, yeah. you went and got the blood. Yeah, it was like we had intermissions in between each film. It was nice, but um, it's actually a pretty smart idea for Alamo to do because they're probably going to make a lot of money on concessions, feeding all these people. Oh, they got good food there. Like too. people are going to be eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. The chicken tendies at Alamo Draft House. Burgers. Oh my goodness. Alamo oh my Draft goodness. House. I think they're my favorite chicken tendies. So Alamo Draft House has this churro popcorn. I never had it. And so first of all. They bring it to you in a giant fucking bucket. It is it's just one size. But your hands are very wide right now. Is that I'm not kidding. It's... it's this big. It's like a like it's like a huge like our huge metal bowl that we have. Really? Yeah, it's that big. Maybe even bigger. And so it's popcorn with um a little chopped up bits of churro in it. That sounds amazing. Oh my god! And cinnamon. So it's salty up. butter popcorn then churros. And yeah, and there's there's salt there's salty cinnamon. I mean there's a uh, sugary cinnamon powder put on all over the thing oh my god it's fucking incredible oh Sounds my great. god i love great churros popcorn. i love a good churro man it was great the alamo well, draft house is awesome it's just so far away it's just a pain yeah. well because it's in downtown, downtown la so oh, it's tough what, to a, park. what a bitch to get to <laughs> <laughs> all right next up we have a trailer there was a tease of this movie last month and we finally got the first full-length trailer for in a violent nature which is the upcoming slasher horror film following the perspective and pov of the killer, and this is like a Jason Voorhees type killer. Uh, he seems like he's been brought back from the dead. He can't be killed, and he's got this crazy costume. And so we're following his perspective. It looks like from start to finish of the film, every kill, every weapon he gathers. He eventually like it looks like he gathers his like look, get, get, getting this like overhead mask thing. And so it's an interesting take on a on a slasher film. I'm curious to see it. I think a lot of audiences are just like, "Whoa!" I, when I, this play, this trailer played at the theater last night, and everyone, a lot of people were like, "Oh, what was that? That was interesting." So I think this movie will do really well. It comes out May 31st, um, just in time for summer. So I'm I'm all on board for this movie. It looks cool. I wish that's what they did for Scream Six. I know. Didn't we say that yeah. would have been awesome? Yeah, I thought that's right. That would have been a cool direction to go in. Just Ghostface perspective the whole film. Yeah. Well, it was for the first five minutes, and then he got killed. So. Yeah, but it wasn't really Ghostface. Yeah. Way to spoil it. Damn. Everyone's seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone. Sorry, everybody, for Anthony spoiling that movie. Spoiled. Sorry, spoiled. Guys. Well, he only spoiled the first five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Anyways. Sorry for the movie, yeah. Let's move into a legacy reboot. Here we go. We got a couple. First of all, we got Beetlejuice 2. Released first a couple images. Then the next day, we got a first trailer, a teaser of the sequel to the original. Tim Burton says he's also using stop motion animation to bring back classic effects into Beetlejuice 2. So, this looks pretty cool. Yeah, you can see it in the trailer. Um, we didn't see much. We obviously saw... A lot of Jenna Ortega. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Jenna Ortega riding a bike. And then we got Winona Ryder. She goes back into this attic. And, and she, obviously, Beetlejuice. After Jenna Ortega lifts up the curtain, see the yeah. little town. And Beetlejuice, he goes, he comes it back. Green lights. I got the juice. Is that what he said? Let, I, let, let the juice loose? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Let the Juicy. Ju- no, he says, let the... <laughs> Let the juice loose. Let the juice loose. Something this, like that. I think that's yeah. what he said. <laughs> I can't what? remember. There's something about juice. Yeah, something about something juice. Something about juice, yeah. 100% <laughs> something about juice. Uh, mixed reaction to this I saw online. Some people are like, I don't care. Some people are like, oh my God. And I saw a great meme where like millennials are like, it's our time. Let's go, millennials. <laughs> I mean, that, go ahead and make another one. I, I just, it's not really a movie we needed, a sequel to. It's because it's such a unique, one of a kind film. Uh, but it could be fun. They seem very excited. Michael Keaton seems very excited about it. Tim Burton seems yeah, very excited. M- m- we got Tim Burton. We got Michael Keaton. Winona Ryder. Kara O'Hara. So we're... Catherine. Catherine O'Hara. We're uh, Justin Thoreau is also joining the cast. Oh, is he? Yeah, he's going to play Winona's uh, husband. I mean, we're good to go. Like, yeah. everyone's back. Locked and loaded. It's pretty cool. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I hope it's good. I saw a Michael Keaton interview, and he said that... For 20 years, they've been talking about doing it, and he they've been saying, oh, that's pretty good, but it's not good enough. And they So they've been saying no to ideas and stories for two decades. That's good. And then he said when they got when Tim Burton sent him this script, he's like, we should we have to do this one. Mm-hmm. And so I saw that interview. I was like, maybe it's, maybe it's very good because if Michael Keaton, he's a smart guy, he's like, I'm not going to do it if it's not going to be good. 
So maybe it's going to be very good. Yeah, he makes really good decisions. Yeah, you know, smart guy. He's wicked smart. He's a smart guy. All right, next smart up, guy. we had another trailer for a famous property. We got the first trailer for Fede Alvarez's Alien Romulus. Now, this is how you do a fucking teaser trailer. You don't give anything away. Nothing. Fuck. There's like six shots in this trailer. The opening shot is like 12 seconds yeah, long, too. Six shots in total. That's all you need. We, we, I'm already going to go. I don't need to see anything else. And did you see the shot with all the face huggers? Yeah. It's crazy. It's nuts. I've never seen anything like that yeah. before. There's like 12 face huggers coming after this person in the hallway. It's awesome. Yeah. And they look a little different. They looked like they were um like dark gray or even black in Could have been color. the lighting. Could have yeah. been the lighting. Yeah. So this takes place in between, in terms of timeline, between uh -huh. Alien and Aliens, right? Yes. In between. In between those two time periods. Because obviously Ripley is asleep, probably somewhere. She's she's, she's taking a big nap. She's taking a big nap. She's big she's cat nap. She's with her, with her kitty cat while her daughter dies. She's <laughs> snoozing. <laughs> <laughs> Newt. <laughs> but um, what I liked about this trailer, besides obviously Fede is a great director, and I'm very excited. We saw great shots of blood, but that opening shot pulling out to seeing the sleeping chambers covered in blood and the screaming in the background looked really cool. And Kaylee Spaney. At the end, with the with the machine gun, yeah, very the, Ellen Ripley esque. It's not a machine gun; it's a plasma rifle. Plasma rifle, Mach yeah, right? Like plasma that. rifle. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, something like that. Um, it looks awesome, but it looks creative. Not that obviously the originals were very creative, but we've had maybe twelve Alien and Predator movies, sixty four combined. Of them, yeah. So, and some of them just lose that creativity and originality. This one seems like it's bringing that originality back. It looks scary. It looks awesome, but it felt sort of. Like Alien Annihilation, the um, is that what the video game's called? Alien. The video game? Yeah. What's the oh, video oh, I don't know. Alien. Hold on. It I did. Yeah, I remember seeing a trailer for that game. It just it 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 felt like it was in really had the same DNA as the first two films. Isolation. Sorry, Isolation. guys. Everyone's just screaming at me right now. Mm -hmm. Alien Isolation. It felt sort of like that. Yeah. Feel of like traversing through the corridors. Honestly, and being I think the Alien franchise. Um, it got so big. Going back down to something much smaller in scale, I think, is the right move. Just being on a ship with a small crew. That's all we need. Let's just go back to the basics. And I think that people should go back and revisit Alien Covenant and Prometheus and maybe realize that those are actually good movies. Especially Alien Covenant. That movie's awesome. I like Alien Covenant a lot. Alien Covenant I is like awesome. We did an episode like on it. that like four or five months ago with both those like, films. But again, since that went so big, let's go back to a smaller scale. Let's go to our roots. Scale. Smaller Score stakes, roots. just a small crew, and one xenomorph. Nah, 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 nah. Hungry xenomorph. Maybe more xenomorphs. Maybe more. The, but the poster is also great too. And Fede actually got the people who worked on the original film, yeah, and the prosthetics and the xenomorph crew from Stan's Stan Houston. Right, what's that? Stan Winston. Stan Winston's um, studio. Studio yeah. brought them for this film. Wow. That's so awesome. they were he's like they were in their twenties back then, but now they're, you know, in their fifties and sixties. Now they're and, in the nineties. And they all have their own studios, they all <laughs> have their so own production cool. companies. But he brought them back to do the xenomorphs. Fuck yeah, man. Fuck yes. So I think that's awesome. Go to the roots of the original, yeah. honestly. And also James Cameron and Ridley Scott both watched the film and told Fede they loved it. Yeah. They didn't watch it together. Unfortunately. It would they cool. watch it holding hands. <laughs> 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 Why do they have to be holding hands? Because it's funny just to think of two famous, like two famous directors holding hands in the theater. <laughs> I'd love to have. Wouldn't that be great to see Ridley and Cameron talk about the Alien franchise together? That'd be a cool conversation. I'm sure there's an interview t out there somewhere. Nothing. 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 Maybe they don't even like each other. They don't even like each other. Maybe they don't like each other. You're just spreading rumors and gossip. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Maybe they don't. I bet they respect the hell out of each other. Maybe they do. I bet they do. I bet you they're friends. They are friends. They hold hands all the yeah, time. They've yeah, they've worked together. On what? On, I believe it was, oh, what was it? I can't remember. I think I think when they were developing Prometheus, Ridley and James were communicating about the story. Mm -hmm. Nice. I think that's what it was. With Carrier Pigeon? Yeah, with Carrier Pigeon, <laughs> Anthony. With, with Ravens. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take it away with uh, some Marvel news. Some Marvel news. Obviously, we know Captain America 4 is doing extensive reshoots. Apparently, more than half the film is being reshot. Starting in May, they go into production. And oh, so they haven't done those reshoots yet. I think yet. they've done some of it, but uh -huh. I, I know they're going back in May to do more. Third set of reshoots. Because, I mean, it all depends on when they get sound stages and everything like that. 
And the rumor, uh, it's been confirmed that Bucky Barnes will not be in the film, which a lot of people are disappointed by, including Anthony Mack he was disappointed by when he find, when he read the script and found out. But he's the one who confirmed that Sebastian Stan won't be on the production. Hmm. That's actually pretty lame. Kind of lame. Yeah. I figured he'd be in it. Yeah, they're best, they're best buds. Yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm excited, but also I don't have my best friend here, so it's a bummer. Damn. That sucks. <laughs> Sebastian Stan's like, what the fuck, guys? <laughs> but I mean... I mean, Sebastian Stan's been killing it. He's, he's doing really well, too. And this movie, I I don't know, man. An extensive reshoot like this, who knows what it's going to be like. Who knows what it's going to be like. At least they got Harrison Ford. <laughs> he's like, every movie he does lately, they just have massive reshoots for. He must be getting <laughs> sick of it, though. Well, as long as he gets paid, he likes getting that paycheck. <laughs> All right, moving on to Netflix's three-body problem from the Game of Thrones creators. Uh, David Benoff and D.B. Weiss finally came out on Netflix on March 21st. It's getting pretty uh, average reviews of 7.6 on IMDb, 3.7 on Google, 74% on Rotten Tomatoes, 64% audience score. So uh, it's pretty lukewarm response for, I'm sure, what for what they were ex- hoping for. Massive budget on this. Yeah, too. huge budget. I do know from what I've read about the story, um, it's a very complicated book series, and then it was already adapted previously in, in China. Um, I thought the trailer looked interesting, but I don't know. I only have Netflix, so maybe maybe I'll watch it sometime in the future. But if you want to watch Three Body Problem, check it out on Netflix right now. I watched the trailer and I I wasn't completely sold on it. It no. looks a little, and I I actually looked up this book like a year ago. I almost got it because I was really curious and I wanted to read something new, like science fictiony. And I, I didn't end up. You can't read Dune for the eighth time. Yeah, man. exactly. That's what I mean. Like I can't There's just other read books Dune over there. and over and over again. And it just it didn't. It it looks like network TV sometimes. It just it has that feel. Not network TV, but it just doesn't look amazing to me. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It didn't. I think they're trying to go for dark, which oh, was the Netflix the series? Netflix series Dark, because and it's also it felt like Hero, the old network TV show. Hero, what's Hero? Or what was the one with the heroes, the superheroes? Oh yeah, heroes. Yeah, heroes. Yeah, and then. Uh, it's it's tough when you have a lot of different characters. You have a huge ensemble on a TV series, and I don't know. I I, I just I wasn't completely sold on this trailer. It, it looked interesting at first, but also at the same time, I was like, I don't know. It doesn't look great. It doesn't look because mm-hmm. when you when you open up your trailer with the creators of Game of Thrones, you expect something to like look as good as Game of Thrones has always looked. Whoa. You always said the first three seasons looked terrible. That's not. I've never said you that. You always said the first season looked awful. I didn't say it looked awful. Yeah. Nuh-uh. You always used to make fun of the lighting. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I made fun you of- You always used to make fun of the lighting. No, I made fun of the writing. No, you used to I make used to fun of the lighting it, all the time. Tits and swords. You, no, no, no. You used to make fun of the lighting all the time. When? Every time you shout out Game of Thrones, the entire first year of this podcast. Fake news. No, you always made fun of the Can lighting. Go back- and find I that. will find this. Go and find it. I will find him. Please, please do. <laughs> you don't remember this? No, I don't remember at you all. Because I think you made it up. The, you always used to shit on the lighting. You when? said you would say it, the lighting looks so bad. Maybe <laughs> the first two maybe, seasons. Maybe you always said that. Yeah, but Game of Thrones turned into a cinematic masterpiece of production. Yes, that's what it is. You, then you said in season four it looked amazing. But you, season three looked good too. You used to always make fun of the first two seasons' looks. Maybe the first season I did make fun of the. Okay, not a lot. Not all of it. Some of it. You used like to make you used interior, to shit on its interiors look. and tents and stuff. You used to make you used to shit on its. It was not perfectly lit. Okay, so now it didn't always look amazing. No, but, <laughs> no, but I mean we had <laughs> seven. Gotcha. We had seven. Gotcha. But I'm talking about what Game of Thrones became. <laughs> yeah, well I know, but it became an amazing looking show. Yeah, but you said it always looked amazing. You, I thought you said <laughs> spider. Uh, got him, guys. I got him. <laughs> I thought you. I said, got him. So anyways, satisfied. Oh, man. Anyways, Satisfied. so if anyone's seen it, let us know if it's good or not. <laughs> All right, we got some more news. And one of the coolest bits of news we got was involving IMAX and A24. Now, in March and April, IMAX and A24 are going to release three films for re release in theaters from the studio. We're going to get Ex Machina, Hereditary, and uncut joms cut joms all in imax which is awesome i can't wait to see all three of these movies in the biggest format possible you know how obsessed we are with that format in those theaters so this is going to be an awesome experience to an awesome way to revisit these movies and i cannot wait we saw all these in theaters oh yeah when they came out but oh, yeah. i mean to see hereditary again in theaters in imax that's gonna be epic 
absolutely epic. Speaking of IMAX, David Fincher has just made a IMAX restoration of his film Seven. Let's go. Which is set to premiere at a festival very soon. I wonder if this is going to get released. Bet your butt it's going to. I hope it does because I would love to see Seven on IMAX. And I'm sure that he he adores that film. And to remaster it for IMAX, it must look incredible. And let's stay on re-releases because we're getting a few more. Shrek 2 is also going to get a re-release. Not in IMAX, just in theaters mm -hmm. in April and May. So isn't the Phantom Menace besides that Skywalker saga? It'll be the 25th anniversary. Marathon. Yep, so that'll be 25th anniversary of Phantom Menace. And also, all eight live-action Spider-Man films are going to get re-released in theaters. So, I think that studios listen to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. I think they listen to our show, guys! Because for years we've been saying, why don't studios just re-release their movies every year? People would go see them. Or like we, every we've other been year. saying this for a long time. Especially, I think this is happening because... This year is going to be a bit of a drought. Yeah. And 2025 is going to even be worse of a drought because Hollywood, even though people think it's back up, it's running, but it's not running very well. There's a lot of people not working right now. A lot of productions that still are getting delayed and really not in the works like they were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So we're going to get less movies this year. We're going to get even fewer movies next year. And so, I mean, this is a great way to get newer fans in, uh, in excited about previous films. And also to get... Revenue yeah. for studios. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Hereditary came out 10 years ago. Yeah. This is really? Oh, my God. 2014, right? Or 2016? I think it's 2014. Something like that. It's one of those. Wow. It's a while ago. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty old movie. So I think that uh, it's smart for your studio to be like, hey, check out. If you didn't see our films, maybe you were like 12 years old when our film came out. Now you can see it again. Now you can see it in theaters if you want and become a fan of the of the film. It's really amazing so stuff. I yeah, I think it's great to just always re-release movies. And I think especially for Spider-Man fans who if Andrew's your favorite or Miles is your favorite or Tom Holland's your favorite and you like Toby but you didn't grow up watching Toby in theaters, I think when you see Toby Maguire Spider-Man in theaters for the first time, your <sighs> will your mind will be blown because of course you saw them grow you watched their movies probably, but when you see those Spider Man movies in theaters, holy crap, man, that was epic. It hits different, bro. It does. A lot of people just saw the Matrix in theaters the, the other day. The first time, yeah. Yeah. And it blew their minds. So I mean, Toby's always been my favorite. He probably always will be. And I mean yeah, sort of Spider Man one and two, those are great. And I, I clearly remember being a kid seeing those in theaters. Spider-Man 2 in theaters? Oh, my God. <sighs> Holy shit. That's the one I... If I had to just pick one to see, that's the one I would see. Yeah, same. 100%. Spider-Man 2 in theaters. Oh, my God. What a, what a, what what a, a picture. picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got some reboot news. This is the first we've heard of oh it in a couple God. months. So, the new Office series is moving forward with Greg Daniels, who show ran the first film and created the first... I mean, sh series and created it is set to develop the show with Michael Coleman, who was the showrunner for and creator for Nathan For You. So that's actually interesting news. The series is likely to be set in a new office with new characters, but same universe. So it's the same cinematic universe as The Office. <laughs> Dunder Mifflin's still making paper, I guess. So I would expect probably a, a cameo from some characters possibly here and there. So the Office reboot's happening well, it's great news to see Greg Daniels back on board, as well as Michael Komen for Nathan Few. That's really interesting because I think Nathan Few, that show and, and his comedy really ties well with The Office's comedy. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully, if they can keep the tone, that'd be great. But the thing is, it's all about casting. Yeah. It's all about the casting. The Office only worked because of the cast. So, I don't know. I'm not, I don't see the need for this or... I don't really have an interest in watching a, another Office show. I probably won't because I'm so obsessed with the original Office. As is everyone else, yeah. That's the thing. Like, you, that was lightning in a bottle, man. Yeah. That was a, I don't wanna, once I, a, that's I honestly, a generational show. I honestly don't want to... I have no interest in watching this. It depends who they cast. I don't care. But I feel like if they cast, they got to go with unknowns. You can't just pop in stars. They'll pop in stars. Because that's what, why the first one, the first show worked. Yeah, but no that one knew was who they were. 20 years ago, though. You got you to gotta get stars to sell something now. Yeah. Gotta oh, well. get them stars, man. Well, Peacock, they <laughs> I don't want that money. I have no interest in seeing an office reboot. All right, let's go. Oh, some more Spider Verse and Spider Man news. So, tell us about it, man. The Spider Verse short film, which I had no idea was being made, called The Spider Within, is getting a release on YouTube on March 27th. The film stars and follows Miles Morales as he experiences a panic attack that forces him to confront the manifestations of his anxiety oh interesting interesting Sounds i don't know cool. how long it'll be probably if it's a short film maybe like 10 minutes but that's pretty cool that they're they made this while they were making the last two films 
Because they've been in production of the the two and three of the yeah. trilogy since That's cool. they started. Yeah. Maybe it was like a, a subplot that they were came up with, and you're like, oh, we can't squeeze this into the film, but we can make a little short out of it. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's like one of those Pixar things because yeah. Pixar they they've often yeah. make shorts of their movies and characters. Yeah. All right. Next up, some Civil War news. Not we're going to war. We're going to war. <laughs> no, A24 <is> Civil War. <laughs> uh, it's tracking to open with a very good twenty one million dollars domestic opening weekend. This would be the highest box office debut for an A24 film ever. And so it is tracking pretty well, pretty well. And they did release a cool marketing campaign of all the characters as Green Green Army Men toys, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, I actually really like that. They're spinning yeah. and uh, they're like visual posters. They're, they're video posters. And it's like you've never seen Kirsten Dunst in this role before. But I thought that was a really clever thing because we love – everyone played with those when they were kids. I don't think they really even exist anymore. They, they're probably out there. But Back in our day, we had Green Army Men. Those, so those little Green Army action figures were always super fun. Yeah, just like a Toy Story. Yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> just like that. We, they everyone, should have brought them back for the Toy Stories. Yeah, everyone had those. They were so yeah. cool. And so they did that with the character for the character posters, which I thought was really cool. So mm-hmm. we'll see. And this comes out next week. The, oh, April 8th. April, or April yeah. 12th, it comes out officially. Yeah, second week of Early April. access, you can see April 8th. Yeah. And it's going to be an IMAX. IMAX. So hopefully I'll we'll get it. an early invite yeah, to we'll check this out. It. Maybe we'll get an I'm, invite. I'm insanely curious about this because people who have seen the early viewings are saying it's not at all what you expect. The trailer is kind of not misleading, but it's not exactly a representation of the film in terms of what you think will happen. Okie dokie. Let's, let's I'm go. I'm curious to see how, yeah. why California and Texas are teaming up. Because that shit would never happen. <laughs> like, I want to know what caused that. But I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe Garland will say, or maybe he'll just leave it at, they're together. No, I'm sure he'll be explaining the movie. We'll see. That's what I mean. Like, it's not what you expect. Mm-hmm. We shall find out. Okay, more news, because we still got a lot to talk about. So much news. So, obviously, the Dune press tour wrapped like a week and a half ago. All the interviews were done, and immediately, Timothy Chalamet went on set and has been seen behind the scenes of his Bob Dylan biopic that he's making with director James Mangold called A Complete Unknown in characters of Bob Dylan on the streets of New York City. I like that. He's been training for this since Dune 1. For music, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and he's he's been playing guitar since Call Me By Your Name. So, I mean, he learned when he, for that character. Yeah, but, he plays a musician. Because yeah. this movie was supposed to be made like two years ago and the door just opened up randomly. The it must wind. Be the wind pushed the door open. So, Timothy's been training guitar and singing for quite a while. I cannot wait to see what it looks like. Make sure my shot's okay because the door bumped into my camera. It, it did get moved a little bit. Am I still in frame? No, I panned away from you. It's better. All right. Well, that's not cool at all. So, I'm very curious. Obviously, Bob Dylan, an icon in music in American history. Timothy Chalamet seems to be a perfect casting. And James Mangold, a terrific director. It won't be his first biopic. So, I, I'm very excited to see where this movie goes. I really do think Hollywood listens to our podcast because it was just announced that a never-ending story live-action reboot is in the works. Yeah, they definitely listen to our show. Yeah, we've talked about this several times. We talked about this two weeks ago. We did. We talked about this two weeks ago. We said, why has never-ending story Who been at rebooted? Warner Brothers work is listening to our show? Can you please just, like, bring us in for <laughs> Hire a us. Just hire us. Yeah, uh, yeah. We will fucking make this. Yeah, that'd be amazing to make. Because we were saying that the never-ending story is a remake that could work because... Um, it was made on a pretty modest budget at the time and has not aged super well. It's still a lot of fun and great for kids, but it has a lot of potential for a remake with modern technology and with a good-sized budget. You could do something really spectacular with a never-ending story. Hell yeah. So clearly someone's listening to the show. Guys, just, just call us in for a meeting, yeah, guys. Yeah, just we can, call us in. If you have any studio problems, I mean, with this, like, let us know. We know what to greenlight and what not. We do. And we'll make the never-ending story. We'll, we'll, we'll get it done. We'll get, he could do it. <laughs> he could do it. <laughs> Fucking departed. <laughs> he slit five guys' throats just to get to me to make the never-ending story. <laughs> and he could do it. He could do it. I'm saying he worked at the airport. You're saying he was nothing? <laughs> I'm saying he worked at the airport. <laughs> you ever thought about going back to school? No offense, Mr. Cassell, but school's out. Maybe it's time for you to wise it up. Wake the fuck wake up. The fuck up. <laughs> All right, anyway, next up. Uh, news. Good scene work. Good scene work. <laughs> yeah, we went pretty far in that one. Filming has begun on Universal's new Wolfman film starring Christopher Abbott and Julia Garner from director Lee Wannell. Uh, this will hit theaters on October 25th, so it's going to have a pretty quick turnaround. And hell yeah. This is how you do it. You release a monster movie in October. 
fucking week of I'm Halloween. I'm looking at you, Universal. Two the, Dracula movies in spring last year. Universal October, listens to us, too. October. For Wolfman. Very excited about this. This is the project that Gosling was trying to make for, like, the last 10 years. He spent 40 years trying to make it. His whole life, he, he was born. <laughs> and he's like, I want to make the Wolfman. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, he won't be able to make it. But It was in development while he was in development. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Abbott, who we most recently saw in Poor Things, I think is an excellent casting. A really talented actor. And Julia Garner is a great colleague. So, I, I think that's those are two smart castings right there. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. All right, we got... House of the Dragon trailers. We got a trailer for the black f- side of the family, and then we got the green trailer as well. Nice. Let us know which family and which team you are supporting. Personally, who are you? Are you are you team black or team green? I'm going to go team black. All right, I'm team green. Oh, interesting. I'm team green. The emerald green, emerald green looks great on you. Thanks. Thanks, bro. <laughs> I got to stay with my boy Amon, man. <laughs> My boy Damon. Damon. Damon, Damon Targaryen. Matt Honestly, Smith is my best friend now. I was going to pick Team Black, but we can't be the same team. We have, <laughs> we have to have a divide. I should have said that. I'm yeah, I got Renera and Damon. They're, they're my squad. Squadding up. Well, I yeah. mean, you have a pretty cool team, though. Yeah. You have a cool team. Well, maybe we should redraft. Aegon's going to be a cool character in this second sure. season. No, but this is awesome stuff. The trailers look excellent. I cannot wait for season two to drop. Like we've brought up before, they were not slowed down by the strikes because they had already finished their scripts and they were able to film through the seasons. It's because they were a UK production completely. Also, yeah, that yeah. too. So they were yeah. filming during the strikes. Yes. And no hiccups at all in terms of delays. No hiccups whatsoever. So this is exciting stuff because that show is excellent. I loved season one. I really, really, really loved it. It's going to be cool. It's going to be really cool. Hell yeah. Yeah. The cat, and especially, I mean, with the new king, it's gonna be really interesting because it's not gonna be a Joffrey like spoiled brat. This this guy, Aegon, is gonna be really cool. It's gonna be awesome. Hell yeah! All right, next up, there's more news for Spike Lee's upcoming remake of High and Low, which is already starring Denzel Washington. Jeffrey Wright has just been cast alongside Denzel Washington. It'll be a remake of Akira Kurosawa's classic crime thriller of the same name. I wonder who Jeffrey Wright will be playing. My guess is he will be playing a member of the police. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing he's the lead detective. Yes. And then Denzel will be the father. Oh, definitely. He'll, he's definitely playing the father. That's probably sure. what I'm guessing. Yeah. You think they'll make so shoes? So you're guessing he'll, exactly what I guess. You think he'll also make shoes for a living? Women's shoes! Women's shoes! <laughs> Steve. It's actually Denzel's playing Steve Madden. Steve Madden. Steve. <laughs> he's a shoe designer. Madden. In the original, the father's a shoe designer. <laughs> they have a shoe company. And they make bank. They make women's shoes, they do. <laughs> they make women's shoes. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what he does for a living. Women's shoes! Women's shoes. He's very successful at it. That's not a joke. It's real. All right. <laughs> if you liked Barbie <laughs> and you want to see a classic 90s and 2000s product turn into a movie, then get ready for the live action film The Sims, which is now in the works now. If they can capture the tone of Barbie because Margot Robbie is set to produce this and Kate Heron's going to direct, if they can capture that tone of Barbie... I think this would be a fucking hit. I um don't even remember if I ever played The Sims. I've, I've de- we never had it at home, but I've played it on other people's computers when, uh-huh. I, was, when I was younger, like going over friends' houses. Yeah. Um, but The Sims was insanely popular, and yeah. it. I mean, they still have been making that game for a while. There've been so many updates and two and new versions. I didn't even realize they were still making that game. I'm but, guessing they'll do like um just the same thing with Barbie. Like uh, it's an alternate universe. Of yeah, Sims something characters. like that, or just that's the world. The Sims world is the world. That's what I would mm-hmm. do. Just no other, no reality. Just make the Sims world the world. That would be really cool. Or you go into the reality and someone's just on a computer playing around. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that would be funnier. But if they can capture what Barbie did, this will be a smash. smash. It, it absolutely will be because so many people played the Sims. It's so already so funny. And what campy. again is the point of the Sims? You just like live. Yeah, it's it's like. Remember- <laughs> you just live. It's a simulated life. You just uh-huh. so you have characters and you set up you just their do world. Random stuff. Yeah, you dress them how you want. You, you have, go to the grocery store. Yeah, you get to pick whatever job they want, and then you do crazy shit. But then there was like you could do wild stuff in The Sims. Oh, okay. Like you could. It, it, <laughs> I won't get into it. But The Sims was wild. But I think if they can use the same the tone as Barbie, Sims. then it's gonna be a hit, and it, it'll make a ton of money. And the I think it, Sims. I think it'd be really funny. It's like a Big Brother living in a house. Yeah, but also because of. <laughs> The limitations of what you could do with characters, but also so many funny scenarios your characters could get into when it, interacting with just environments. I think they yeah. can really do something good here. Yeah. I very mean, camp, very funny. I think this is uh, a recipe for some good comedy for sure. So this is a video game movie that I think will work. Sims has been around for 22 years. Yeah, they've been making it for a while. Long fucking time. <laughs> Long fucking time. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, next up, let's move into our next bit of news. Happy Gilmore 2 is in the works. Adam Sandler confirmed the script is under development. How do you feel about this? Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to like say this. If, if Sandler, if his comedies were still excellent, then I'd be on board because I love Happy Gilmore so, so much. Whatever. It is what it is. Like we said, we, we say all the time, reboots and re- legacy yeah. sequels, they're just going to keep happening. Well, you want, would you want to see it? If Sam, I mean, yeah, if Sandler's in it, sure. Sam in it? Unless, if it's not a Netflix movie, I guess. It probably will be. If it's a theatrical release, I'll see it. Wait for the trailer. Yeah. I mean, because the, the thing is... You can't recapture Happy Gilmore. Sequels to great comedies, when do they work? Like Anchorman 2 is... Anchorman Julia- 2, it's not great, but there are great moments in it. The That's funniest the scene was a blooper cut scene. Yeah. Feel uh, that. It feels that. just like a <laughs> cock. <laughs> exactly. That's the best scene. Now I know me. what the villagers of Pompeii felt like. <laughs> <laughs> My frothy ejaculate is all over me. <laughs> Paul Rudd can't keep it together. Yeah. That's You're so- right. The funniest moment <laughs> in that movie is the blooper. And, um, and Zoolander 2 was not good nah, either. Yeah. So I'm not sure about sequels to great comedies like 20 years later. They never seem to work out. Yeah, you're right. It's too Dumb bad. and Dumber. Er? Nah, not, not great. Yeah. It's not a great plan. Not a great plan. All right, next up. <laughs> the Pooterverse has been announced from the makers of, um, what's his name? Uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot his name was Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey filmmakers have announced a huge... Uh, gigantic monsters verse where they're gonna do Bambi, they're gonna do Tinkerbell, Pinocchio, Peter Pan, Tig, uh, Tigger. Tigger, Piglet, the Mad Hatter, and Sleeping Beauty, and they will all have their own films and then unite in a horror team up movie called Pooniverse Monsters Assemble, um, which will be released in theaters next year. This is crazy. So the titles are, are hysterical. So we have the Twisted Childhood Universe, also, uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey Part Two. We'll have Bambi, The Reckoning, Peter Pan's Neverland Nightmare, Pinocchio Unstrung. So those are some of the titles right now. I mean, good for them because they they made that movie for like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, mm-hmm. something like that. And it made like what twenty mil? Made a lot of money, yeah. So go for it. I mean, you might as well cash in on what you just created. And it clearly, th- and they're actually they don't really have um, distribution. So I actually saw the trailer for. Uh, Winnie the Pooh 2 Blood and Honey 2 last night and it was one of those it wasn't like it It was like an events ad you know what I mean mm-hmm. at movie theaters so it doesn't seem like they have distribution but they're doing setting it as a bunch of events at theaters interesting this is how they're doing the release interesting a Fathom Events Fathom Events yeah, something, not Fathom but something like you know what I mean mm-hmm. well people will turn up people will go let's move on to some more news Roadhouse the new film from Amazon starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor, which is a reboot of the original starring Patrick Swayze, was released. We watched it. We had a watch party on Discord with our, our patrons. And it's pretty good. The action, the fight scenes are actually pretty excellent. Very, very interesting the way they filmed it. And it's trying to cash in on, I mean, it's trying to feel like the original with the Western vibes and the campiness. But it's it's not a classic. It's not like a guilty pleasure movie like the original is. But it's still pretty good. It's a good watch. Jake's awesome in it. He's just really, he stands out from the rest of the cast in a lot of ways because he's so talented. Not that the rest of the cast isn't talented, <laughs> but he's, you know, he's on a different level. So, yeah. And you can really tell. Uh, but it's pretty good. I, the fight scenes slapped. They were really good. It was so, they actually, they did a new thing with the fight scenes. Um, they So for every shot and every fight, they filmed four different ways. So they did one normally with the actors not hitting each other. Then they did one with a, like a fake head. That you can punch, and then they did one with a, a pad over the actor's head to block it, and then they did, did a fourth shot, and then they blended it all together with CGI. So that's in this in this movie, it's not quite perfect yet, but it seems like it's a precursor for making really interesting looking fight scenes, where you don't have to cut away or uh, do a stunt choreo. You can actually make it look like they're actually hitting the heads with well, their it's fists. Still stunt choreo. Yeah, still stunt choreo, but it, you don't have to like. You don't have to frame it as a way to to, dis- to disguise it. So if you remember with the film, you're actually seeing impact of fist on head. 
which you never see. Yeah, you're not. Film. You, so you're not stacking your. So that's yeah. what it's called stacking your punches or yeah. stacking your blows, where you put space between you and the other stunt performer, and your camera angle hides the space where your face. Because when you're actually punching someone on camera, you're yeah. like several inches away from their actual face. But it's called stacking with the camera and with the character and the performers, where the angle it looks like you're hitting them. And they did that. They did that in this film, this new technique, and it it looked good most most of the time. You could actually, like, they're actually showing impact, and they're not cutting away, they're not changing angles. CGI is a little noticeable at times, so I think in the this is like a, a step forward in this new direction of how to perform fight sequences. That could be really interesting. Yeah, it looked really cool. It's visually, yeah. I've never seen anything quite like it before. Yeah. It was really unique and new, because a lot of action starting to look the same, which... It seems like in Hollywood, action gets reinvented sort of every 10 years, and then a bunch of movies kind of capitalize on that style. Obviously, John Wick, reinvent, not reinvented, but they, they took action in a new direction and mm -hmm. did some new things, but so many movies are starting to take on that John Wick approach that's kind of getting a little stale, but this is actually something new that I was really intrigued by when I was watching it. It's yeah. cool. But at times, you're like, is this a green screen or is this CGI? Yeah. But it's actually not, which is, well, it's blended. So. Blended, yeah. There's a, there's a pretty significant amount of green screen CGI in that in the film. But it's pretty good. The script's not amazing. It's, yeah, it's, it's good. It's, it's, fine. Good, it's good time. time. It's good time. time. It's, not like the, it's not like the original Roadhouse is a great movie. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's not like it's a revered classic. It's like a guilty pleasure movie, Exactly, though. exactly. But this one isn't even a guilty pleasure yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a Jake shirtless movie. Yeah. <laughs> he's shirtless a lot. Everyone's hating on Conor McGregor in this movie. I fucking love Conor in this he movie. He's fun. He's just, he just being himself. Yeah, he's just, yeah, just whatever, man. He's like a cartoon character. What do you in this expect? Movie. You want him to actually try to act? <laughs> he's, he's just flexing and just walking around yeah. with a massive trap. It was, it was fun. It was just shut your brain off, fun movie. Uh, something else that's fun X Men 97 came out and it's 100% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. We have not had an opportunity to watch it yet, but everyone is saying that it's really terrific. Yeah, it's uh, they brought back the old cast, um, from the original series, and so it's just very much catered to original fans. Everybody seems extremely excited and satisfied from what they've seen so far. Yeah. Also, there is a new trailer for Monkey Man, which I'm not watching because I want to walk into the film. Um, with just that first trailer, I've seen once, and I don't want to see anything else. So I want to walk into it as blind as possible. They also released a new poster. Um, this film's coming out very soon. I cannot wait. Very excited about this. Stellar reactions from South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. uh, some more Dune 2 news. Or Dune news in general. Of course, it broke $500 million in the box office that we brought up. But in terms of Dune Messiah, which would be the third film in the trilogy from Denis Villeneuve, he says he will only make the film if it can be better than Dune Part 2. Otherwise, I don't do it, he said. Dude, you can't leave it on that cliffhanger. I know. I know. That's that's pretty nuts. I think he, he could... I think he could make a better movie because Doom Part 2 is better than Part 1 in a lot of ways. He really just learned so many lessons, I'm assuming. We talked about this in our episode uh, about the filmmaking process of, you know, filming Arrakis in, in the Dune world. Oh, you want to hear something crazy about Greg Frazier? Not really. He sure. used, <laughs> the cinematographer, he used Unreal Engine to prepare their shoot. So they, they, they used Unreal Engine um, in the software. You Apparently, you can, like, for Previs? For Previs. And for shot planning. Mm -hmm. So they were able to literally pick any spot they wanted in whatever deserts in the world they were filming in. They were planning to film in. And then there's this software in Unreal Engine where it showcases uh, the, the sun. And any time of the day, you can change it to whatever setting you want, where what, whatever time, wherever the sun will be. And so they actually were able to plan to a T every single shot outside of where, like, say, Chalamet, we want to shoot him right here with this spot that we scouted. And in the Unreal Engine, they can look. He was able to look and be like, okay, if we shoot him at 4 o'clock, we'll get this exact light that I want for the shot. That's wild. So they did, they did that for all their pre-production um, and previous planning. I, I've actually seen a commercial for a couple different softwares that do this that can kind of, you can take a location anywhere around the mm -hmm. world. You put in a time of day and it lets you know what it'll look like. It's very hyper-realistic to, like, pinpointing where you are, if you pick like a spot, some random spot in like Utah, Cal in Utah, and even with the day of the year, yeah, because the sun will shift. Obviously, it'll show the sunlight and show how the sun will travel, what it'll look like on yeah. camera. If you have like a car there, if you have a person yeah. there, I've actually seen some shit like that. It's pretty wild. So they would have they had, they made like a, a bunch of digital characters, and they were just they would just put them on a spot in the exact spot where they were planning to film, and he would be like, okay, let's frame it right here, and then let's see what time we should frame it at. Okay, twelve p.m. We'll frame this shot. And so we'll just write, we'll just note that. So when we get to that location for the shot, we're going to do it exactly at that time that we saw at Unreal Engine. That's insane. Isn't that crazy? Insane. Fucking technology, bro. Insane. All right, two last bits of news. 
Boondock Saints, the cult classic, is getting a legacy sequel. This is like the fifth one in the episode. Man. And Norman Reedus and Sean Patrick Flannery will reprise their roles in the film. It's unknown if Willem Dafoe is back. Doesn't he die? Doesn't he die? He does die. Sorry, it's been a while. Oh, I'm trying to remember. Does he die? I think he dies. I can't remember. Doc Saints. So Boondock, I haven't seen the movie in like 20 years. Willem Dafoe die. Does he die? Someone's screaming through their car radio right now at us. <laughs> Has he left the police? He's helping. He's helping. Uh, bah, 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 bah. I think he survives, right? I don't know. So Boondock States, like I think he sequel, does. I can't remember. Is back. It is in the works right now. And then our final bit of news. Peaky fucking blinder news. Peaky blinders. It's confirmed. Obviously, they're making a Peaky Blinders movie, which will end the saga. And Killian Murphy will be reprising his role as Thomas Shelby in the film. Fuck yeah, man. Very Stephen cool. Knight has been planning this. So they, I'm glad because they ended on a cliffhanger, the, the show. This is going to be a huge hit. Yes. A huge hit. Huge. Killian also, coming off Oppenheimer and Oscar win, yeah. coming back as Thomas Shelby. Yeah. Holy fucking shit. Everyone wants to know what he's doing. Everyone, yeah. yeah. In terms of his, his selection, I know he, he was in a movie that got released after Oppenheimer. It was, it was like an Irish an, film. An independent yeah. film. Small budget movie, but obviously... Post Oscar when what's his first choice going to be? This and then 28 uh, years later. Yeah. Pretty good. Pretty cool. But Pretty I mean, those movies are still in development, so it's not like they're going to production soon. Also, Sam Claflin will be the villain of the movie. In the Peaky Blinders movie? Yeah. That's a really good Because he's been the villain. He was the villain of the last two seasons. Mm -hmm. He's fantastic in it. It's the best thing he's done. He, thing. That dude can act. I didn't realize how good he was at acting until I saw him in Peaky Blinders. I was he's like, good. Yeah, he's really good. I was good. like, holy shit, this, this guy's crushing it. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of actors who are in young adult franchises, they get a stigma on them for a little while. Yeah. Because he's in the Hunger Games franchise. Also, you got to bring Tom Hardy back. Yeah, you have to. Have to. got to bring Tom Hardy back. So it should be fucking cool. Absolutely. Very excited about that. All right. That wraps movie news this week. There was a lot to get to. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. Be sure to get tickets to our live show in Boston on April 18th at the Middle East. Get those tickets ASAP. You ASAP. Go to our website, Raiders of Lost Podcast. It's right there on the homepage. Just click the button to get those ticks. We'll see you there April 18th at the Middle East. I think at 6.30, 7 o'clock, something like that. Also, leave those five-star ranked reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. And take care, everybody. See you next time. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.